Hello, everyone. It is the Red Men Originals podcast. I'm Paul Machen. Alongside me have Chris Pajak, Chloe Bloxham, and Dan Club. Fabulous moods abound as Liverpool are, of course, top of the tree, top of the Premier League, um, with nine games to go. Oh, Chris, oh, that's me. I could see your face <laughs> clenching, but I, I heard many. Well, that was parts. after the sofa got squeaked there, sucked up into my <laughs> anus. <laughs> <laughs> there we go welcome back everyone again <laughs> yeah great um we are going to be talking about uh, Liverpool's win over Brighton uh, we will be doing much more on the Arsenal City game which is mad to, to, to do so much coverage of one of the dullest games of football of all time but uh, we're going to do that on the Bias Football Podcast which follows after this one over on Redman Plus uh, where we have a good old look at that we're also going to be laughing at Man United on there again because back down with a bump, Everton also. And not really back down with a bump, just Everton being Everton. Uh, that will follow over again on the Bias Football Podcast later on. Uh, we're also going to have a chat about Liverpool's managerial prospects with Xabi Alonso ruling himself out and a little look ahead to Sheffield United on Thursday as well. The big but, but before we do, you idiot. Because, <laughs> well, the- <laughs> before we do, uh, it is prize draw time. Uh, our club legend. Uh, prize over MMM Plus was this this month it was a signed shirt uh, from 97 98 signed by Carlines Riedler um, I was there when he signed it it was great Chloe expertly handled oh, yeah. that one um, Thank you. so we've got the wheel of names up we're going to draw that now guys I'm going to click spin can we have a little uh, drum roll Fred lads, congratulations! Fred lad has just won that absolutely fantastic uh, Liverpool shirt signed by Carlines Reeler, signed by a guy who won a World Cup uh, as well as played alongside obviously Michael Owen and Robbie Fowler and and all those good lads as well. Well, Robbie Fowler. Um, mm-hmm. <clears throat> This month's competition prize will be announced a little bit later on on the show, so stay tuned for that one. Right, let's get into it then with the game itself at hand. Liverpool 2, Brighton 1, Christopher Pajak. Um, it was a big banana skin in prospect. Yes. You know, I think we kind of looked at the Liverpool have gotten through all their, their in inverted commas, sort of toughest games. I haven't got through the Man City game. We're all feeling optimistic despite, you know, a, a variety of things. Obviously, the United the defeat in the FA Cup was a bit of a kick in the teeth. Um but there was a danger, I think, of like going, oh, well, you know, it's kind of plain sailing or whatever. We're generally quite crap against Brighton. Um, so to actually get that win under our belt uh, was massive. And, you know, after 90 seconds, it could well have gone a very different way. What was he playing at there, well back? Yeah, being like, good. That, well, I don't know how old he is now. He's got to be 30 years old. It's the best ball he's ever hit. Yeah. It was an unbelievable strike, wasn't it? Like, it was absolutely brilliant. And then once again, Liverpool are behind and you're like, oh my goodness me, why are we doing this again? Why do we have to do everything the hard way? I mean, don't get me wrong, if we win the Premier League, I'll look back on these games and these moments in games throughout the course of a season where you're like, oh, that was the best way to win it. But living through it is horrible at times, isn't it? But then, uh, but we absolutely battered them as well. We dominated them from start to finish pretty much, apart from maybe 10 minutes at the end where I got really really nervous and wanted all of my lads. I was screaming at them. I was screaming at them. Pass the ball, go to the corner flag, stop shooting. I mean, just didn't know what to think and how to feel because I said this last night on a video. I am not trained for a title running anymore. We had last season off. My emotions were all over the place. I had every single emotion from every single title challenge racing back through, through my body and spilling out like a volcano to the point where I didn't know how to feel anymore. And then I had to go and watch another game of football where I've never actively watched watched the game of football and not wanted the team to score so mm. I didn't know how to react during that game either it was just a horrible and yet great day yeah mm. absolutely all of all of that um, all bundled into one yeah it was a wild a wild time Chloe and I don't know I, when they scored that goal so early I'll be honest I've seen that happen that many times this season that I felt quite not asked about it but it, obviously what we needed Liverpool to do was to react to that and the good thing is, is they, they did and they got control of the game. Yeah, I mean, we, we go down early and my first reaction is, 
well, we like to do this and we play much better in the second half. And that is not a reaction you should have in a title race. It's, we're one nil down, Jesus Christ. Everyone panic and, and hit the panic button. And it wasn't that. It was, it's all right, lads. You've got, you know, 80 minutes of a game left to go. Well, yeah, just build yourself into it. Um, we managed to get the goal back, obviously, through through Luis Diaz, which is just a poacher goal, to be honest. It's brilliant by him and he's, mm. on, he's on his toes. Um, but Liverpool had a lot of possession. I just thought we, we struggled to break them down. I thought Brighton were brilliant. You know, the triangles playing out from the back were really good. And their outball in the first half, it was obviously down their left hand side, and it was just in between Quanter and Bradley, and we kind of struggled. I thought Bradley going forward was brilliant, uh, but defensively, I thought him and Quanter struggled in that first half. And the way we adapted in the second half, I hardly saw that ball happen mm. at at all. Um, and that's all credit to Liverpool. But at half time, I literally said, people around me literally said. We've got 45 minutes. We don't need to rush anything. Let's just come out with more intensity. Um, let's, you know, take more risks in terms of passing through the line, see if we can move them. And let's just not get um, angry or frustrated. Just keep the ball moving. Don't try and force it. And the, the second goal is one of the best goals I've yeah. seen live. It was unbelievable. It was uh, it just it just occurred to me on just to, just to jump back to Chris's point down about Welbeck. There was a point where like Sturridge and Welbeck were like contending to be England's yeah. main forwards. So I, it, you forget that because obviously Daniel Sturridge is kind of like his career kind of petered out and whatever. Mm. The fact that Welbeck's still there, and he, look, he, he's given us some tough games o- o- over the years and whatever. But yeah, Wild that Wild that was still here conceding Danny Welbeck goals. Um, but yeah, I, I thought uh, uh, Chloe kind of summed it up. Uh, nicely just as well as Chris had really that Liverpool had to get themselves in the game and we didn't really have it our own way I was talking to Chris on the way back about how to jump ahead in the second half I expected us to come out strong Mm. but actually we didn't come out quite as strongly as we have done in previous games because we really had to work for it because Brighton are a kind of team they're very they're very kryptonite like to what we do you know we don't it's very difficult for us to have it all of our own way and yet at the same time we did dominate the game it was it was an odd one yeah nothing comes easy against a side like Brighton I think that's fair to say you don't they don't tend to give up possession um, with any sort of ease whatsoever and that makes life difficult certainly for side like us in the man that we play even Jürgen Klopp spoke about this pre-game and he was kind of asked a pretty straightforward question why do you find it so difficult to beat Brighton certainly since the Zerbi's come in he said just because of the way they, they want the ball so much and they use the ball it makes life hard for yourself so yeah every single corner every single tackle every single bit of possession has to be hard fought and hard earned and we found that I think in yesterday and that is testament to how good we were the fact we were able to for, for large parts dominate proceedings is just shows you how wonderful we were on the day but yeah I think in terms of going behind it's it's a well trodden path now as if Liverpool fans have become ever so slightly immune to it whether that's healthy or not I'm not quite sure but yeah it just shows how just how confident we are we're obviously brimming with that mentality and that belief that we can come back from any situation the fact the goal so early as well helps a little bit but yeah I think obviously Danny Welbeck wonderful strike by the way I agree with Chris on that mm. one absolute quality strike but yeah if you are going to um, have a bit of a resurrection on Easter Sunday it doesn't feel like a bad day to get oh, it in um, oh. sorry sorry everyone I had to get it in there basically. <laughs> but yeah in terms of us listen we were, we were outstanding but against what I said Brighton a good side and Brighton on their day and I said this earlier on I think this might have a sort of a lead into what happens in the title race because they've got to play both City and Arsenal on their day they can hurt and make life difficult for any opposition I'm always a big fan of of it, of playing the teams that are going to play your opponents first mm. because it's almost like they get to sharpen themselves against you before they then that go level and, of opposition as well exactly yeah, yeah. exactly you you don't you want to be the first one in that clutch to play them that's my, that's just opinion that might not be borne out in any sort of evidential way in terms of whether it helps or I, I, but I feel it does it feels like if they've they've get able to give Liverpool a good game then they'll be able to go and give those other they're out of Europe now as yes well, they got done they? by Roma didn't yeah, they yeah yeah so I mean that's something that you hopefully will work I, in there if I just on that kryptonite thing I think what it is with Brighton is they want the ball with their defenders very very deep in Mm. their own half in their penalty area and Liverpool's natural reaction is to go and press because that's what we want to do but they bait teams in and then once they're past that initial press they go they go to the midfield and, and stuff so I think it's kryptonite because we want to do that and they want to bait us into it mm-hmm. and once they're around it yesterday for me it was all about Virgil van Dijk being proactive 10 yards into their mm. half and nipping back and winning the ball from that number 15 in the middle of the pitch because that's the way that they build up they do that all the time they knock it around the back but they, they, it's funny because I thought Liverpool did a brilliant job and yet I also thought Brighton were actually superb at it as, as normal but there was a point where the, I can't remember I think there was a fella about five rows in front of me 
And they'd played about 35 passes around the back line and broken free. And he shouts, it's too easy. I'm like, lad, they've just played 35 <laughs> passes to try and get round our press. And you're mm. shouting, it's too easy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's like, because that Liverpool just was so good at trying to get mm. that ball back. And that's the first time I've seen Klopp change the way we play against Brighton. Yeah. Did he shout, hit the target when Salah missed? <laughs> no, but well. I heard him shout, shoot. Worth the keeper. Uh, at any point <laughs> when we were in the their half. Can we reiterate? To rate this on the Joe Gomez thing, by the way, we've ruined Joe Gomez mm. with this shout stuff, uh, shoot stuff because shouting shoot stuff um, because he now doesn't know when uh, when to shoot and when not to shoot because he had a perfect opportunity in the second half when he drove towards the 18 yard box and he's got a clear light line of sight to the far top corner and he chooses to pass it and then there's another one later on where he batters it into a bunch of legs for no reason yeah. whatsoever. Um, yeah, there, there were, yeah, a lot of a lot of bad shouts uh, at various moments during that game but that's the thing is that we there's a lot of talk all the positive Arsenal talk coming out the weekend is how they've finally managed to like turn it round against Manchester City because Manchester City have been doing their heads in for years and it's I know and again it's there's a levels thing of course but like yeah Brighton have given us nightmarish times over the last few years and yet to be able to ultimately no matter how we went about it to be able to just beat them and we arguably should have beaten them more comfortably and yet you can still come out saying Brighton played well and Brighton have got a good a good thing going on yeah, yeah we had 30 shots against them yesterday yeah yeah, yeah. I mean, first team in the league I think this season to do that yeah. so I mean we've done something right haven't we there do you think just on that sorry do you think with Brighton obviously loads of teams do what Brighton do but are they just exceptional at it do you think then the it's way the, they build out I think the it's it, the way that the Zerbi wants them to do it is it's all on Pascal Gross and he mm. moves and he, he, he moves from one block to another and goes up with the play and stuff so they just knock it around and then have all of a sudden two to three bodies in the middle of the pitch and they'll play the out ball straight to that number. I, I don't know who it is the number Maybe. 15 is that Maybe who he is and that's when Virgil was jumping in front yeah, he and he was so far away Dyke. from the rest yeah, of the defensive yeah. line because we'd times. just gone that's where you have to attack them mm. because if the, he gets the ball and turns the there's a problem okay. for us so that's what I saw from where I was like it was interesting Mike, Mike Matty they picked up on Connor Bradley being more front foot as well of like the amount of times you go well you're getting picked off in a one on one so we stopped trying to defend that guy and defended the guy in front which is like not, none of us would instinctively think that's the solution to the problem is to give up more defensive position and be more from put and you know to stop yourself being weak potentially mm. at, at the back but again bravery of Liverpool on display was just just brilliant um speaking of bravery let's have a big old chat about Alexis McAllister Chloe um how long have we got <laughs> we'll look, we'll go we'll take as long as it needs yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> as long as it takes he um just brilliant just absolutely brilliant I, I, I commented post-match that I've seen a number of players that we've signed particularly like internal Premier League signings where they've come up against the former team and not been quite at it tons of guys we had from Southampton never quite performed against Southampton oh, and a great example of it um, oh god he didn't perform against the former mm, team there, yeah. was a, there was a moment where I thought oh, that was it man. yeah, oh, yeah. Oh. DM me um, but there was none of that pitch from... invasion <laughs> yeah. if he scored there none of that from McAllister whatsoever no, he's absolutely unbelievable. Um, it's just, it's the intelligence from him. It's the way he uses his body. We, we speak about this week in, week out. But that is the first time, I mean, he's, he's done it several times a season, but it's the first time where he has had a team on strings and it's very much just Alexis McAllister. And Alexis McAllister was the conduct of, of, of every every single thing that Liverpool did. I think he might have misplaced one pass and it was to Harvey Elliott, which could have made it 3-1 and that was about it. But everything was pinpoint accuracy, the weight. Uh, the, uh, a Salah should have had a, a hat-trick in, the, in that first half. The precision of those passes, you can't get them wrong. How many times do we see players trying to do that and it goes straight to the keeper or goes straight out of bounds? It just takes a bounce. But the weight on it was ridiculous um, and yeah he was incredible and he was incredible defensively as well he is that number eight box to box mm. now that, that we've seen and we've mentioned it before playing that role of being a number six has really really helped him with his tenacity with winning the ball back um, and no matter where he is on the pitch no matter how much pressure he is uh, you can give him the ball and what I love is his intelligence because there were times where Quanta struggled a little bit because it very much felt like what what Brighton did was they were like, right, well, we're just going to put one person on Virgil because he's the one who we don't want with the ball at his feet. We'll happily have you on mm. Quanta. Give him all the time. And Quanta didn't know what to do sometimes with it. And I totally understand that. There was times where he could have strided forward and maybe done a little risky pass, but 
he's a young centre half who doesn't want to. He's in a title race. He doesn't want to get things wrong. I totally get it. And what Alexis McAllister did was when that right hand side did struggle a little bit getting out, it was okay. Well, I know to float over this side of the pitch and make a triangle so I can do this lovely one too and we can get out. Um, he was absolutely everywhere, superb. Um, and what I will say is, if Liverpool go on to to win this league, um, this last three months uh, Alexis McAllister is one of the lads who've dragged us over the line here. He, there's a moment in the game Dan when he gets snapped in the middle of the pitch and he goes down <laughs> for treatment and then he, he he doesn't have to go off because the lad gets booked so he, he drags himself to his feet and then play re- begins again he gets past the ball within like 10 seconds and he just floats this like almost inch perfect ball over the top mm-hmm. and that was just him all game long I've seen players with that level I mean like we've seen Thiago and Cater who are sort of in similar ish mould. Different, but you know, similar similar sort of ish. Um meant supposedly tigerish sense creative central midfielders. And they've just you know, you can you can rock footballers like that sometimes. And McAllister just none of it. Mm-hmm. Haven't have absolutely none of it, just continue to, to carry on with his game and even after that he just got better and better. Yeah, absolutely sensational. Like we've I'm quickly run that as superlatives for him in recent weeks he's been absolutely sublime like at the centre of everything again yesterday for me you're absolutely right to mention the names you mentioned there and I think a lot of players we've had of that ilk down the years have flattered to deceive a little bit but McAllister absolutely none of that like he is integral to everything we do right now and I think big shout out to Otto Endo in, in yes. there as well yeah. Get, allowing him to allowing play. him and free, freeing him up to flourish and, and show his true potential no two ways about that he's taken off a lot of that workload as much as McAllister is still doing yeah. his defensive duties and win the ball back and all that sort of good stuff there's no two ways about it for me since those two have started working in unison Mikhail's has just gone to another level entirely and yesterday was probably his, his pick of his performances to date which is something given how incredible he's been in recent weeks just his use of the ball Chloe mentioned his intelligence there it's absolutely spot on and his vision as well what he can see he seems to see things on a pitch that nobody else really can you mentioned that little floated dink over the top the, the assist later on the execution of that is absolutely sublime it's, it's a joy to watch right now Alexis Mikhail it really is and he is what we've been crying out for as as good as we've been this season exclusively in recent weeks it has felt a little bit like okay we're, we're staying a little bit closer to the wind here in terms of what we got available to us he's made everything okay literally everything fine hasn't he had like nine goal contributions in his last like 10 games as well which wow. is a, a yeah. little bit silly um and it just goes to show that this is the play we actually did buy and he sacrificed himself for the for the first majority of yes. the, the season yeah. like he was heavily criticized because he wasn't the player that everyone expected it was and- a wasn't it Getting yeah, all the exactly. And, yeah, yeah. Um, and there was like loads of things brought up this weekend where like rival fans have put like, why is no one talking about the flop, McAllister? And it's like you actually from like the start of the season, and now um, you you like watch him, and it's like he played against Brighton, and you think to yourself, how have we stolen for thirty yeah. five mil? Like that's a joke. Yeah. I was on the first to say I'd be a little bit underwhelmed by a start to Liverpool career. That wouldn't say flop. That's, that's no, ridiculous. that was rival but, fans. Yeah. But, <laughs> anyway. but I was a little bit like, okay. Okay, because of Sabozlai being so good and because we expected so much from McAllister, but he was very much doing a job in the six, essentially. He was doing it perfectly fine, by the way, but we weren't seeing that. I thought we'd signed this. This is better than what I thought, to be honest. But I thought we'd sign more like this. We weren't seeing it for the first few weeks. I was a bit like, okay, but my word. Like, here's the heartbeat of Liverpool Football it's, Club right now. It's when, like, we've seen it over the years, haven't we, when Gerrard's in the middle and every player looks for Steven Gerrard and passes him the ball. And that's what every player is doing right now with Alexi McAllister. It's where is he? How do I get the ball to him? And it was interesting. I don't normally watch like the match of the day analysis and stuff. I normally just watch highlights and, and move on. But I thought their analysis on McAllister was excellent yesterday. And, you know, they mentioned that Mo Salah had said to him in the week, you need to play the ball earlier to me. And then, I mean, he could have had, what was it, nine goal contributions in the last 10? Did you say yeah. he could have had nine goal contributions for Salah yesterday? <laughs> yeah. Because there was that many passes to him over and over again on, on an absolute plate. That you're just like, there's nothing he hasn't got. He's got the tenacity. He's got the vision of a, a, a Steven Gerrard or a Trent Alexander-Arnold. He's got the passion ability of those two players plus a Xabi Alonso. He's got absolutely everything you need. He only bangs a header in at one point <laughs> like yeah. during the game. So yeah. he's starting to find out to get into the penalty area for us as well. And you know, I think now what we're seeing is a little bit of rhythm with playing on that right-hand side a few times. Mm. And there may be a bit more of an understanding with what Mo wants. And I, I do think there was a bit of a tactical shift again yesterday to get Mo, Mo involved in front of goal a bit more that worked 
Not sure the finishing from Mo Salah was quite <laughs> up to the standards that we probably expected. I thought he was arse, yeah. to be honest with you. I thought he was absolutely terrible, uh, yeah. but still scores the winner, which yeah. is classic Mo Salah, well, isn't it? Well, that's the best players in, in the world do that, don't they? You know, they can yeah. beat you without being at the best. Interestingly, on the McAllister thing, so uh, according to transfer marked so far this season, he played 21 times at defensive midfielder with one goal and one assist since moving to central midfielder, 14 appearances, four goals, six assists. Yes. I mean, that's outrageous. For yeah, sentiment. yeah. That, that also goes to show what we were saying about him being underwhelming. I'm not being critical, but during his time as a six, he was perfectly fine as a six. Mm. But we all felt we all felt we were scratching the surface with how yeah. good he was as a footballer. You move him into the eight, and look what you're getting. Plus all the defensive stuff as well. It's incredible. And also, we all had been sold a dream at the fact that you know he was that number eight. Yeah, he did a double pivot. For, he comes for with his head on his back as well. Yeah, <laughs> he does. Yeah. But what what we'd seen is is the creativity of Alexis. Yeah. McAllister and that Brighton side as, as much as before he moved to that double pivot so I think we all thought that this was the McAllister we were getting and when it wasn't um, you know it, it was because he was sacrificed himself to, to go into a job for the Reds and can we talk about the fact that Liverpool are top of the league with a lad who is how, how tall is he um, he's a number 10 but how tall is McAllister he, he played 21 appearances for Liverpool as a DM this season and Liverpool at the moment in time top of the league. Five, so, did someone see the, the, someone put a tweet out uh, I think it was yesterday it might have been Andrew Beasy about how many games we've played with a completely new midfield from last year did you see that one I saw the general conversation around the, around yeah because again Endo Sobersly McAllister there it's a mm. brand new midfield it doesn't look like a brand new midfield no. does it in terms of play less than a season together and stuff and I must admit right if I'm Harvey Elliott now I'm looking around thinking how am I going to get into this side mm. I mean I play some of the best football I've ever played and now there's a lad who's playing on my position in the eights who's running the game yeah. you look, I feel a bit sorry for Harvey because he's not getting in in front of Salah he's not getting in front of McAllister where, where does he get in? but also he's still only 20 so like you, you know he's he's got to think to himself he's got a long road ahead of him at Liverpool and by the way that switch of play when he came on Brilliant, was absolutely yeah, was. ridiculous as well yeah. Um. He, he, but also he's been a saviour for Liverpool this season at times like coming off the bench and really dragging us over the line and, and knowing Hey, I'm a Liverpool fan here. I was a Liverpool mm. fan first. I'm gonna put the one, it'd be the one to put the hard yards in and get the winner. Yeah, so he knows he has a massive contribution at Liverpool. Um, and whether you know you, you can be angry with not starting, but at the same time, if Liverpool win a win a league trophy, my word, has he had such a massive say in that? It's interesting. I just quickly wanted to check me my facts on this because I wanted to say that that goal assist returns probably as as probably as good as anything Liverpool have had from a central midfielder. You know, under Jurgen. Klopp and um, I just went back two seasons because obviously the last time we were good and we played a lot of football that season Henderson and Fabinho both had nine goal contributions three goals six assists for Hendo eight goals one, one assist for Fabinho and that was as good as it got from midfield be careful well. Paul put that graphic back up for a minute uh -huh. You can't be changing, changing the uh, St. George's flag like that. <laughs> oh, <laughs> <no>. <laughs> yellow, yellow. Very good. <laughs> um, no. But on so far this season, as mentioned there, <laughs> um, Alexis McAllis is on 12 with five goals and, and seven assists, all comps. You've then got a little bit further down. So Bosley's got seven and four. And even then you've got Harvey Elliott play a little bit in the front line, of course, but uh, three and seven. Curtis Jones, five and, five and three. It just speaks to, yeah, Liverpool's midfield. Are, are the business and McAllister's only just of late sort of being yeah. unleashed to the party there and uh, yeah long may that long may that continue I thought he was I thought he was brilliant um, and it's just one of them footballers that you just enjoy yeah. watching makes us tick at the minute yeah, sensation really, really, really does yeah I love him um, quite a first half because I've seen a few people in the comments kind of referring to it Um uh, Nunes and Sabozlai more leading toward the Sabozlai chat here Chris I guess you know he um, he's he's not been right you know I, I think he had that initial sort of bursting onto the seed I remember going you know doing TNT for the, for the Wolves game and extolling his virtues he had a brilliant start to his Liverpool career I think he had a bit of a sort of lull in the middle since coming back from injury I don't think he's quite been at the races and I think he was <laughs> He was largely, at best, really bang average, I think, through most of the game until about 20 minutes to go when it was a bit like he went, 
oh, I've got loads in the tank left here. I'm going to start running around. And then, he, yeah, he, he really started to get back to the, the player that we know he is again. Yeah, it, 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 it's an it's interesting one for me because he, I think he's struggling getting involved in the game. I don't think he's playing badly. I just don't think he's involved in the game. And sometimes that's the player and sometimes that's the team that you're coming up against making it difficult for them, isn't it? But it's kind of felt a little bit on the player to me. Like, not showing for the pass quite as much as maybe Alexi is or, or Endo or the wide players and stuff like that. So, I don't know whether he's got kind of lost a little bit in this sort of change back to the left-hand side and not really understanding where he's supposed to be and what the team want from him. But you're absolutely spot on. I don't know whether it was 60, 70 minutes or something, start tearing past lads. And his pressing's always good, whether he's involved in the game or not. But, like... I think it's the second goal, isn't it? He's running down the yeah. right hand mm. side and he clips in a great ball to Alexi McAllister, who obviously does what he does, which is play one of the most beautiful assists you'll ever see. Um and it, he just he, he just gets stronger and stronger and stronger. It's it's it's, it's a, a bit interesting for me because I don't really know how to feel about him at the moment. I know we've got a great player there. I just want to see more from him each and every week. Yeah, well, it's interesting, Dan, the shift to move him to that side, you know, because mm. he's played as the right side that he fought us all season long. And McAllister's kind of started to crop up in there and, and look really good in there. So Bosley's now in Curtis Jones's pot instead. And it actually starts to tell you a lot, I think, about who's made themselves the most important now Sabozla's had injuries so he's not been able to get that that, that run of games since, since the new year it's been quite a broken 2024 for him so mm -hmm. far um, but I kind of yeah I mean I tell, tells you Alexis McAllister's there he's absolutely flying Sabozla's not getting in the team if he's playing in McAllister's position at this point so mm -hmm. move him over to that side and then wait and see what happens when Kerr comes back and see who, who wants to fight the most for him yeah that's kind of how it feels isn't it and that's been the case a lot really with that left side of the day position when you think about Gravenberg and Curtis Jones at one point when Sabozlai was the hot hand and he was playing really well whilst McAllister was in the six but yeah I think you are <laughs> A little bit accommodating Tom Sabozlai in this side right now because he's not firing all cylinders. McAllister is very much the guy and he is, you know, he's got his place on the right hand side and rightfully so. Whether they've fallen upon it, whether they spotted something in training, whether it just works, I'm not quite sure. But McAllister feels a shoe in on the right side of the eight right now. And I wouldn't have said that at the start of the season either, to be honest. So, yeah, I I'm all for it. And I think Sabozlai does need to sort of up his game and improve his performances because you're right, he's, he's sort of flitting in and out of games right now. He's having the moment. You think, okay, now he's back to his best and then he's not all of a sudden I don't know whether it's a confidence thing I think positionally he hasn't done himself loads of favours because obviously he isn't playing probably on his favourite side right now I think when he goes away with Hungary he plays in a completely different position again so he feels a little bit all over the place he can't quite get any rhythm going I think he's a wonderfully talented footballer there's no surprise about that I don't think he'd go from being bursting on the scene and being the next Steven Gerrard in waiting to being not very good I'm not sure that's a conversation but he definitely feels as though he needs something to fall back into place, something to click into gear for him. Um, and as for Curtis Jones coming back, yeah, I think, I think that position's fair game right now, to be honest with you. I don't think Sabozla is nailed down. As much as I think and really like the balance of that midfield three of Endo McAllister Sabozla, I think that's got a little bit of everything. It's got the tenacity, the physicality, the pressing, and above all, the quality. I think if Jones gets back up and running and get back up to speed quickly, there's a conversation we're only a week away from that conversation being a very real thing. I think there's something with, with him, with Sir Bosley, um, Chloe, that he obviously, he's had to deal with injuries and he's had to deal with a little bit of a setback in that as well. And there was just maybe a little bit of something where is he, is he playing within himself? Is he trying, is he worried about whether he pushes himself? Can he can he go? And if he, he doesn't want to be out again, he's had a lot of pressure on his shoulders. You know, he's such an important figure for that, for that Hungary side that, yeah, you know, it's hard. It's a hard mindset to get out of, but it generally felt a little bit like like breaking through scar tissue or something in, in the game at the mm. weekend. I was, I ended up feeling loads more positive around him, and, and he didn't have a brilliant game from start to finish, as I say, but he ends on a high. So actually, you get to walk away feeling loads more positive around him. Whereas, you know, if you brought him off on like. 60 minutes if we'd made earlier substitutions which we didn't which is quite surprising in this game you might have left with a bit of a you know a, a bit of taste in the mouth thinking about his performance whereas actually he got to he got to turn it around by the end yeah he did and I think what we need to, to look at is the fact that you know at the start of the season he was the one who would, was never substituted mm. like he was the one who you were guaranteed to play 90 minutes because yeah. he had it in the tank uh, and because he, he suited us so well and he was in such good form and he's never really gotten a break obviously this injury has gotten him a break but also it's the it's it's not a break being on the sideline it, it might you know energise you even more but also you've 
you you're knocked back in terms of fitness and things like that and it's hard to get back into a rhythm um and he plays week in week out look hungry played two games and he was incredible for them and he's their captain he plays 90 minutes no matter what and i think it was bournemouth away where we played him and since then i just felt like it was one game too many in that period and i don't think he's ever got back to the play he was before then but at the same time you see the quality that he does have and I think where we mentioned McAllister goes to find the ball he creates the triangles Sobo wasn't wasn't moving towards the ball, wasn't creating loads of space. Um, and Brighton were doing a really good job. And when Sobo is at his best is when he's in between the lines and when he's driving at people. And he got that chance in the second half. He picked it up and he was on the off turn. And he was, you know, taking three players out the game by just sprinting with long legs past them. Um, and I think he slips one into uh, Darwin Nunes, who the, who the keeper then saves it. Um, and I think what we also have to take into consideration is when he was at his best, he had Trent Alexander-Arnold and Mo Salah on the same side of him. So much creativity. We're right now now on that left hand side where he's playing you've got a Joe Gomez who's playing the inverted and there's an overlapping and a Lucho who's very much doing everything that he can because he's got to make up for the fact that he doesn't have Andy Robbo bombing down to cause you know the the space on the left hand side so he has to kind of cause it for Nunes or Nunes has to run around him and create it for Diaz um so he's he's got a, a, a little bit of trouble there but to be perfectly honest um he the the biggest cheer of the afternoon was 75 gone and he decides to just sprint down yeah. every single lad until they mm, keep yeah. a boot that out of play yeah. and that was a that's why you're in the team lad mm-hmm. and you keep doing that and you'll keep your place because what is Klopp's philosophy it's pressing from the front and if you're the best at that you're going to be in the team yeah. um so he's got the quality there he just needs more rhythm and we we also got to think this is a different level of pressure to what he's ever felt. He he did it for RB Leipzig and yet hungry, but hungry aren't the 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 team that everyone expects to go and win no. Euros or expects to go and win anything. You're at Liverpool now and you're top of the league now. There's a lot more pressure on you, um, and hopefully with his best mate back in the team soon, uh, he can you know they can help each other and, and force each other to to be better. Shake hands as the substitute <laughs> for each other. No, okay, sure. Um, the I want to talk Luis Diaz, Chris. Um, just brilliant, just brilliant again, and he's another one alongside Alex McCarthy, and I think Harvey Elliott's the other one in this as well, who've dragged really dragged Liverpool over the line in the last five or six games. Um, four goals and three assists in his last ten league games. I, I, I rolled it to ten because in, re- in reality it's actually four and three in his last eight, but just to make it a nice round number, I went I went all the way back to the start of um, the start of the new year. Prior to that, it was three goals and one assist in the 18. This is in the league prior to that. So it tells you what you're seeing with your own eyes. Is It goes back to the rhythm thing. He's finding his feet. And our chief concern around him was, is he going to score enough goals for Liverpool? Well, that is much more like it as far as a goal retainer goes. It, it is, and he's coming for... It's some difficult conversations, I think, between Liverpool fans around them. You know, I did a new show last week, and you know there was talk about Barcelona wanting to sign him for a hundred million pounds and all this type of stuff. And I think a lot of people were were quick to say, "Well, you'd sell him for a hundred and you buy someone else." And I was trying to make the point that well, people are not quick to go. Where the fuck are Barcelona getting hundred million <laughs> well, pounds no, from? No, my actually, boy. I think that when it comes down to, I said I tried to explain it. Like, listen, if it was football manager, I'd probably do it because you can go and sign someone who's going to get you thirty goals a season on Footy Manager. But it's not; it's real life, and we've got a world class footballer who's performing week in, week out. He doesn't quite get as as many goals as we'd like, but he's a successful player. He's brilliant for us. He's a, he does an incredible job for the team. You're risking a hell of a lot in selling Luis Diaz to try and replace him, and that's what it sort of comes down to for me is that he knows what we want and. At times, he's the heartbeat of this side. Like, there's times when we just won't be denied, and it stems from Luis Diaz mm. and his work rate and his want to get the ball back yeah. over and over again. And yeah, I don't think he's a killer in front of goal. I've said it countless times, but every other facet of his game is brilliant, and you would not swap that for anybody. And it's mad, isn't it? Because I think nominally I agree with that sentiment that he's not a killer in front of goal, except. He also is because if you put the ball, if you put the amount of times he arrives in those between the sticks sort of situations and scores like a mad, gets a mad like the goal at the weekend literally is mm. such a poacher's finish. It's it's untrue, but it's 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 whenever he seems to he does so much work so far away from the goal that he never seems to get into. Like enough by the time well, no, well, he's ran seventy yards or hundred percent or whatever. All. And what I mean is, like, listen, I'm not talking about him as a finisher. His natural instinct isn't like Jotters to get 
into the box in the same way. He gets into the box, but Jota would do it five times more a game. Yeah, That's man. what I'm talking about when yeah, I say yeah, it yeah. rather than a finisher and stuff. So I just think yesterday's performance, again, epitomised Louis Diaz for me, is that you, he's going to leave everything on the field every single time for the red shirt. And to be quite honest with you, I can't ask for much yeah. more there than was a, a player. There was a guy by me, Dan, before the game, and he said... It's a Paul, I saw someone on Twitter saying, God, I've had enough of Diaz. What's he, why is he starting? And I was like, mate, I honestly don't, I don't get it at all. And, and, and I feel like pulling people aside and go, you know, we've got like those mad opinions on Diaz just going, I know sometimes we get wedded to our negative opinions. We, we form an opinion mm. on a footballer and then you just, for some reason, people choose to die on that particular hill forever. But I just kind of want to go over to these people and go, Listen, just just away from the glare and everything. You might want you might want to just have a word with yourself here because you're making yourself look stupid. Because like what? Okay, if you're going to measure him by let's say let's say Sadio Mane's metric, yeah. he's probably not going to score as many goals as Sadio Mane did for Liverpool. But also, he is a different type of footballer. And when I look at what he, he goes out on the field, and as Chris says, he pours every egg of energy into every game of football that he plays for us. Mm. He fights, he battles, he gets your arse off your seat every single time he gets on the football as well. And he's scoring goals and getting assists as well. I just I just think he's magic. When you've got Darwin and Salah scoring, getting 30 to 40 goals and assists in a season individually, mm. He's just a perfect addition to that. Yeah, he'll do for me. Um, <laughs> you're absolutely have to, you have to spot on because, and I think the Darwin and Salah thing, and you could probably throw Joko Jota into that conversation as well, is, is actually quite important in the round this because so much of the spotlight is on Diaz where maybe Salah isn't there or Nunes wasn't there quite recently and a, a few fat chances do fall to Diaz in a tight game and he doesn't put them away. That's when people start going, ah, he's not this. He's not when people start harking back to Sadio Mane because he isn't that guy. But you're right, he's incredible. He works so, so hard. He's tireless in his effort. He's got bags and bags of quality. We all seen that on display with that mad run against City the other week when he left Kyle Walker and Rodri for dead two or three times. Like He has got everything. We've seen this since day one. He was He hit the ground running as a Liverpool player. He has some issues, might be too strong. He has some drawbacks, I think it's fair to say, when it comes to those numbers. He's improving on them as we speak, which is brilliant. I thought the goal yesterday was a real sort of, I want to see more of that, because that being on the move, being that striker, that poacher's instinct, that boss, I love all that. And he's done it a few times, but there are times whereby he can leave you a little bit frustrated, leaves you wanting more. But I think the people who do, the detractors and the naysayers of Louis Diaz are... I don't want to disrespect anyone, but people who look pretty much solely at numbers mm-hmm. and go, well, his numbers don't stack up to Sadio Mane, don't stack up to Mo Salah, et cetera, et cetera. But when you have Mo Salah, five and all cylinders, you've got him scoring goals, doesn't matter. Likewise, Darwin Nunes, likewise, Jogo Jota. It's just when they're not there and Diaz has to be your main guy. Not only has he got to be your main guy in terms of performance, which he so, so often is, but he also has to be the one sticking the ball in the back of the net. That becomes slightly problematic. Yeah. However, having said all of that, Wonderful footballer. Yeah, I mean, and look, Bobby Firmino's numbers don't stack up to Darwin Nunes' numbers. No, but, but no we one adore said, no him. One, no one says that. Yeah, yeah. You know what I mean? Because that's not part and parcel of it because he went the Sadio Mane stick. And it goes back to, I think it's dead right. I think he frustrates when he's picking the ball. And this, this is the problem. Because we're saying at McAllister, it's a, it's a it's a compliment to McAllister that we just want to give him the ball. Mm. And we want to give Trent the ball. And we wanted to give Thiago the ball. And we want to give Van Dijk the ball. Our back, like, sort of six are desperate to pass the ball to Virgil Van Dijk all the time. Well, you know what I mean? Like, and they always just wants to give it to Van Dijk. Because why wouldn't you? Because he's just going to pass it 40 yards up the pitch and get you, get you in a different situation. You give the ball to Diaz because he knows how to handle himself. Mm. And you know he'll just hold on to it for a few minutes. You might be knackered and you just need to get out for a second and get, get your breath. Give it to Louis Diaz. But the problem is, is that Louis Diaz is picking the ball up on the halfway line, holding two men off, dribbling past one or two. And twice. Then, yeah, twice. <laughs> and then what? You know, that's yeah, a yeah, He's yeah. miles no, away yeah. from actually having the decisive impact. He's the ball so often though, isn't he? So, but, so often. But Chloe, the two, the two goals he scores at the weekend are exactly mm. what we you need to work Diaz into those situations. The goal that does, the, that's not given against Tottenham Hotspur, you know, the those the, the, the goals this allowed at the weekend. You want him, get him in the box with the ball and he'll score more often than not because he is good enough to do that. Yeah, he is. Um, and look, I go back to the first game of the season where he scored that goal and I thought, Sadio Mane, then, if you could if you could do that a yeah. bit more then unbelievable uh, because he's got the qualities he's the like you said 
there. He's so, so good with the ball at his feet. Um, he loves cutting inside and, and taking the shot. And he's just, he's had less opportunities for that because we don't have a flying fullback at the moment who's dragging a player out to get the space for and Lewis that needs fucking off a bit anyway because yeah. if he could score 25 goals a season doing that then Phil Coutinho would have been an absolute smash yeah. at every club that he, he was at um, but yeah look he's he's a brilliant footballer um, and you know he's he's put himself through 120 minutes 90 minutes time after time after time and got us over the line um, and yeah his goal the other day was was ridiculous it's just like you said he's on his toes he's expecting it he's anticipating it I said it was a Diogo Jota type of goal and, and it very much felt like that and if we can, you know, have Salah back and who hopefully will start getting into form and when these chances fall at him, he'll score five instead of scoring one, then you don't need Lewis Diaz to score. You just need to be him, have him causing scenarios in which it leaves other players free or he can do a give and go or he can stretch the team. They did the give and go with Salah never got the ball back. Yeah. Um, <laughs> should have got a goal there yeah. as well. Salah yeah. should have just played it across back He wasn't for but... going yesterday, Salah. <laughs> <laughs> the give bit was fine. It was the go that yeah. he just, 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 to, just to segue this into a Salah chat, by the way, because look, no, it was funny because even like the match today, pundits are laughing like he should be passing it. You got three strikers on the panel there going like, yeah, as if, as if I'm, I'm yeah. never passing it. So I, I you know, forgiving Mo, Mo Salah for not passing. But I did get that first hint. Darwin Nunes was raging with them all first half because like Darwin's just done a stretch where he's been Liverpool's main man and people are passing the ball to him and he is sticking the ball in the back of the net and all of a sudden it's a bit like, all right, yeah, we're back to this again where everything goes through Mo and we could really do with Mo to score him so that he can start well, turning and exactly. the game. Exactly, if he scores in the first minute, he gets six assists. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> no yeah. problem whatsoever. Yeah. But I felt, I honestly, I felt like Salah played in a different position yesterday to what we've seen recently. And I know we've not seen a lot of him, obviously. The match of the day commentators mentioned that it's his first start in the Premier League since New Year's Day, which is wild that we're still top of the table when we haven't had Mo for a full three months, by the way. Yeah. Um, but like he played a lot more inside and yeah. a lot more centre forward. And obviously, mm -hmm. when Nunes goes off, he plays centre forward. But yeah. he was just a lot closer to the action. I don't know whether that was a shift by us. To well, just he go, starts wide. Give the space he? to Bradley. Yeah. Get him down yeah. that. Don't, you, you, you don't need yeah. to be there anymore, maybe that, man. Maybe that coincided with Bradley deciding, fuck this, I'm going to go forward, as yeah. opposed to trying to defend well, yeah, him. Yeah, but also so the thing, it all fits nicely, doesn't mm -hmm. it? I mean, if you put Sobo there. Sobo there, sorry. Sobo. Sobo. Wow, Sobo. we've got a new Sobo. one. Okay. <laughs> if you put Sobo there, right, you've got him wanting to get in there, you've got Salah wanting to get in there, you've got Connor Bradley wanting to get into the same space. Alexi can just sit back a little bit, watch the other two lads where they're going and ping balls all over the place. You're like, you know, none of you listen to what I said there. No, they no idea. Right, it's okay, so He's <laughs> all thinking of jokes. <laughs> Sobo. Um, um. Yeah, no, I think it's an interesting point because Salah starts very, very wide right for us, really hugging the touchline, but yeah, he, it's interesting that as the game goes on, mm. it definitely works because you're right. Salah starts being in that inside channel, doesn't he? Yeah, it's just the right hand side of the eighteen of the eighteen yard box. That's where he's making his runs and entering the the box and getting on the end, getting on the end of stuff. So yeah, great. Can I just say that uh, back to the the Luis Diaz thing? His dad isn't helping him out. His dad needs to shut up, to be perfectly honest, because we're in the middle of a title race here and you're talking about how you hope Fancy and you've still got hope that he's going to Barca or Real Madrid. Knock it on the head, lad, please. I I'm loving you dancing and taking photos with all the opposition. Can get behind that. You know, but just I... rein it in for the, the next three months. No, because it's an interesting point because I, 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 randomly I was thinking about this at the weekend because I think like Fabrizio Romano was one of the first people to amplify that those quotes. But then equally, once it had gone on a bit, he then amplified the notion of... Don't worry about it too much. He was just asked the question yeah. by the South American press about this, and he was just answering that direct question. Whereas we see it without out of context as like like his dad's got into business for himself here in an old wrestling parlance of like, right, I'm going to take it upon myself to get my son this dream move, which isn't what happened. But it, it goes back to this this notion: of the problem with social media is Romano gets the, all the fucking clicks and engagement off this, and then when it dies down, he gets to do do the flip side and get the clicks and engagement on on the other side of it and in, in reality someone should have just come out straight off the bat and gone here's here's what was said and why it was said and where and where it was said but yeah it's come out his dad looks like a fucking but massive also, bell end next time you're asked about it just turn around and say he's at Liverpool please just yeah. just do that and just whilst we, in the summer you can do whatever you want to do but right now whilst I'm trying to focus on trying to win a league title just don't mention well, any other football there's game. a great thing I learned from doing the, the Jordan Henderson documentary and I think this happens a lot for footballers is the footballers tell their dads to stop talking to the, to, to, to the press in certain situations because 
dads can't help themselves, mm. you know, when you because you, your pride outweighs all this thing, and it's probably just quite excited to talk about, you know, it's, but of course Barcelona wanted my son. Why would you? Yeah, I'd say be that. mad not to. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Of the best clubs in Europe all wanted my son. Can we just talk about how amazing <laughs> that is? By the way, instead of thinking like, well, actually, this might be construed slightly differently in the social media age or whatever. Um, no, but yeah, f- f- fair enough on that one. Um, a couple of bits, Bradley and Quanta. We touched upon Bradley and how he uh, he really got better in the game. Jarell Quanta. It was interesting, Chris, because in our Red Men group of all our contributors and whatever, the some, I think Steve put like the leak team in, and I think it was James Sutton went oh close to full strength that, and then I was like cool, and then I looked and it was like. We had Keller in goal, Bradley at right back, Quance <laughs> at centre half, Joe Gomez playing left back. And yet James was right. And yet he was right. <laughs> but it, it goes to show, I had it said on the Totally Football podcast, both Bradley and Quance, I think it's their seventh league start in their, basically, you know, in the Premier League, in their careers. Um, at no point did any of us look at that team and go, oh Christ. Mm. And then even when they had a sticky start at the start of the half, in the first half, never really asked. And as, by the time the end of the game, I was just, I was just marveling at, at the composure and brilliance. Yeah, I think it's probably Jürgen's given them a, a like a, a nod of the cap there because it's not often he'll start two young lads next to each other. You know, quite often if Quans is playing and Canate is playing, Quans will play the left, so the Canate will play the right and sort of break the kids up around yeah. the back line. But I think the trust is there with both Bradley and Quans. He, he just goes, yeah, you sort your problems out. And I think you saw that. I think the first 30 minutes, I don't think either were very good. And the last 60, they were imperious, the two of them. And they were winning their battles. And if you win your battles, Sleep Punk used to always say this, if you win your individual battles and everyone wins their individual battles, you go on and you'll win the game. He's and- not dead, by the way. He, he's fine. <laughs> Yeah, he's absolutely fine. Well, he's probably yeah. would still say that. Bonded. He's not there. No, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> so he's next to always say this. <laughs> God bless him. <laughs> yeah, yeah, true enough. It was those again the persistent situations where you're thinking because it was near the end of the game. There's no escape in it. I think we all felt a bit varying degrees of on edge about it. And the amount of times they try, continue to try and, 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 and test us, putting the ball into the channel, over the top, pace, trying to chase things down. And he, not just getting there, but actually being strong and getting there and winning your battle and then having the composure to play out from the back and actually choosing the moments just to stick it out of play well, as there's, well. There's times when Konza, I think he was in the sort of right back position um, and he's not only winning it, he's not knocking the ball out of play, he's turning on it and yeah. passing. And you're like, wow, the composure of this centre half to be able to do that in what was a very high pressure situation mm. in terms of a league title, in terms of the game. And mm. they just, they never take the, like, they, they make the good decisions. There was a time when the ball got um, to Connor, uh, to, sorry, to Bradley at the back stick and he just knocks it out yeah. for yeah. the corner, just goes, that's the best thing to do. Mm-hmm. And, Maturity you know, there. Yeah, and, and that's yeah. it. And they make the right decisions over and over. There was a moment in that second half where the ball goes over Quantas' head and he kind of Filth. doesn't deal with it. Filth. And, like, you think in that moment, oh, my God, he's being done here. Like, he's he's you just being crap on the ball and all of a sudden a nice little Cruyff turn here. See you later, lad. You, you go that <laughs> way, I'll, I'll get off this way. And it's like... The composure to not panic in that moment and rag the player back or bring him down or try and foul him. It was just the composure of, okay, I've been beaten, but I'm getting back and I'm winning the second battle instead. Um, and it's ridiculous that we've got like teenagers playing at the back in a league title race and they're playing like this. Yeah. Um, and the maturity of them in that second half, because like you mentioned, they struggle first 30. And in the second half, I did, I hardly heard the peep out of Brighton no. from that side. I'm me? in awe. I'm in awe of the, the pair of them. To be with you. It's just sensational to watch. And you're right. Brighton did target that side. No two ways about it. He had a drink, a dingo running at him, and kind of badly spoke about how difficult that was. He was but good. he was good first there. He was yeah, good. Yeah, but we, we speak a lot about Liverpool being able to solve problems in game and on the pitch. And whilst it's going on, these two have got that. They're absolutely got seven stars. It's it's phenomenal. Like how is this possible? Where have these come from? And they were both in League One last year. They're just sensational. But you're right. Quanta actually makes that situation tricky for himself because yeah. he doesn't get the first bit right, but he doesn't panic. He just goes, okay, I've, I've messed up a little bit there, but it's fine. He essentially heads it to himself, holds off his man, shows a turn of speed to get in front again, turns him, and away we go. I mean, what more? He's 20 years old, yeah. and he's played like a handful of games. Frighteningly so, good. Yeah, no, uh, 100% on that. It's great. And again, just, just lastly on there, I think also 
the presence and brilliance of Virgil van yeah. Dijk helps a lot. I think the calmness of Kevin uh, Callagher at the back as well, McAllister, and even when Harvey Elliott comes on the pitch, just being that will and ball. Like, Harvey Elliott, you know, he plays right hand side, and I, I think those games are the perfect times to bring Harvey Elliott into the front three. Not when you don't need his pace. When you know you're going to play against a team that's going to stick a load of men in, the, in, in inside the 18 yard box, ask him to unpick, but he'll go back. He'll do all the dirty work mm. for you as well. So actually, they've got the assurance in themselves of. I've only got to take one or two touches here and then look if it's nothing's on I'll empty it but in reality if I come back inside I've got Virgil there if I have to go back I've got Keller here there both of them I'll have it all day long and then Alexis McAllister always makes himself available for it and down the line later on again Harvey Elliott so yeah brilliant the way the team works they allow us to have young players in there because they give them a platform they give them the out ball constantly if you if you leave them to their own devices they could have been. We could have sold all those players down the river, but no, I thought they were was, both. I thought they were both, bro. Was that um, speaking of Callagher from the cop? It looked like it was an incredible save from that header. From was it? Done. Was it a good header? All like, was I know it about save, that sorry? right is the goal looked four times bigger than yeah. a normal goal. <laughs> <laughs> and the goal just got bigger and Keller was smaller I was thinking how is he going to save that <laughs> and it was a good save it looked a good save but obviously we're the other end of the pitch and it kind of looked like it was going in slow-mo yeah. at the it same time it wasn't good time. for my heart I know that yeah. Yeah. it's one of those saves where the more you watch it back the easier a save it looks like he, he, he gets down there quite comfortably by the end right. but it's one of them it's going towards the bottom corner and he's got to get down and get a good strong hand on it yeah that, so um, really good the save from their keeper off Salah was probably the biggest uh, save I that that took a deflection as well it did it made it even hard yeah the Salah first time found the bottom corner he actually you know, apart from his actual finish produced a good finish but somehow he kept it out yeah. I don't remember oh, this chance. oh Chloe it was a sensational save when was it he was yeah, I don't know when it we was. We worked it quite well. He was inside, well inside the the eighteen yard box, like probably just outside the six. He struck it well. Salah took a little nick off the defender on the way, and the Bruggen got down and tipped it wide. It was, oh, it was, a hell of was a this save. where it could have been three one? Would have been three one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. It was brilliant. Yeah, I remember save. that. Good save, save. Yeah. Anyway, if the goal could stop taking fucking Mario mushrooms when <laughs> people are having shots, that would be fantastic. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, the goal, it's like that, uh, the Jaws focus pull effect, where like we panic and then it just gets bigger, 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 bigger behind them. Um, right, Liverpool are top of the league. Um, Get it! Yeah, uh, we'll do more on this, of course, because obviously we're going to talk about the context around it with the, the, the City and Arsenal result that followed over on the Bias Football Podcast later on. Um, but I did think it was interesting. I saw a tweet, it came out last night, but I saw it this morning from a guy called Gunnar Punner, um, who said Liverpool comfortably third best in the league, oh, yeah. and there's nothing their annoying fans can do to change that. Um, mercifully, we don't have to change that because we've got the players who've put Liverpool top of the league um, two weeks ago though wow. but it did make me think about this about I've, I've really been struggling to verbalise it of because like obviously City had um, Edison out and they had Walker out and Stone was only fit enough to start on the bench so they've had a few a few injuries De Bruyne has missed half the season Arsenal have had a few here and there you know throughout Timber. the season as well Timber's missed the whole season you're right you know, a couple of full backs have had injuries and Jinchenko's missed a lot of footy and I just feel like it just—it's like people have stopped talking about it. Mm. And so you know, again, it's again because we, we've had a couple of injury rack seasons over the years, and eventually people just get bored of it and start cracking on, and how accepting we've been because of how brilliant we've been. But I just can't help but wonder. So, I, I, and I, I think I might do a little bit more on this on the next show. But I, for my own like visualization, I, 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 you know, it's mad when I did like a, I did a, a chart for this, but a spreadsheet. Excel. I got an Excel. Well, wow. well, you know, Google, the Google one oh, the of like who's been of who's been <laughs> yeah. missing in this sort of spell for us, and it, that ten games post New Year thing because it goes back to that Salah point of it was Salah's first start since New Year's Day, which is absolutely insane, and how many footballers we've been missing since then, and. I, so I, I kind of did it and I drew up from Alisson, Matip, Canate, Trent, Robertson, Jones, Thiago, for the sake of argument, Subozlai, uh Salah and Jota. Good side. And it, honestly, like, you know, I think that's nine, nine, nine lads who conceivably would start in a best 11 for Liverpool. You know, you could you could certainly make that case for, for most of them. And I know there'll be a few people going, Thiago, but a year ago, Thiago was in our best midfield. You know what I mean? I'm not, and I, and I, so I can happily make that case for him. And he also plays for us in this period, of, of, uh, by the way. Um, so he's not just been, minutes. So, yeah, yeah, five minutes at centre half. Um, 
but it's actually that post the Arsenal game that I think is so interesting because obviously we we lose to Arsenal and at the, at the, at the, as that game finishes we are two points ahead of them at the top of the league City have got two games in hand over us and are only five points behind so it's, it's basically all handed to Man City we've gone through that period and then post Arsenal since then like Alisson hasn't played a minute of football for us Matip's been out that entire time and Karate's missed two games in that time one through suspension Trent has missed four has missed five of those six games since then Thiago's missed all of them Sabozla's missed three of those games Salah's missed three of the games since then uh, Jota's missed four of them um and now the league table says we are two we are still two points ahead of Arsenal but we are now three points ahead of Manchester City and I just can't Imagine if we had two of those lads mm. back Do in that period. Like if we just had Trent and Jota or Allison and you know, and Allison and Jota or Allison and Trent yeah. or I mean fuck me, Thiago and Matip. You know what I mean? It's yeah, I so I feel like Man City is still the best team in the league, intrinsically. And we say a lot like Arsenal are the, the best coach. They've got the most goals. They've got the best defensive records. And yet Liverpool are top of the league, having missed all of those footballers mm. for this spell of time. I are we? No, I, you know. Can you bring the Can you bring the tweet back up for me? Do you mind? Uh, yeah. And because it, it's not something that I actually disagree about. The first sentence: Liverpool completed their best in the league. Sounds. The problem is the second part. I have a problem with. And I was thinking about this after watching the City and Arsenal game and stuff, right? Is they're very metronomic, aren't mm-hmm. they? They they don't react to what's going on in the stadium. Because, well, when you're building the side in empty stadiums, you've got to be metronomic, you've got to be absolutely excellent. I think it's like two fences, isn't it? They're the brilliant swordsmiths and all this type of stuff. But all of a sudden, you're going up against the fucking Jedi. You can use the light side and the dark side of the force and fury and love and emotion and fucking happiness and everything. That's what our stadium brings. We get angry when a decision goes against us. Liverpool tap into that fucking power and start fucking flying with the swords. And we get happy and Liverpool tap into that. So... Yeah, they're not. We're not the best coach sides. I don't think. I think Arsenal and City are absolutely superb, but we've got something they don't have, which is our fan base and which mm. is the power to react to what's going on around us. And they talk about momentum in sport, and a lot of people will tell you momentum doesn't exist in sport. Psychological momentum does exist, whether that's in sports or just in fucking real life. There's studies on it. Go and check them out if you're that way inclined. I didn't for the sake of this chat. Um, but that is what you can, can happen is how do you turn a negative result into a positive Liverpool do it we've proved that time and time again because we've gone behind in games and we've won most points from going behind mm. we use those negatives and we fuel ourselves from it and stuff like that whereas the other side don't react they just keep doing the same thing they did doing and keep trusting that Guardiola and Arteta have coached them to a way where they're better than the opposition Liverpool are the anti-Arsenal and the anti-Manchester City who use everything around their surroundings you might not be the best wielder of a sword but when you've got the light side and the dark side of the force who gives a flying fuck yeah. and that's why the fans and Anfield and what Jürgen Kopp has built within Liverpool Football Club and tapping into who we are have a great chance it's why we're top it doesn't matter who's out we'll use it as fuel to the yeah. flames and we'll keep on that, fucking going and we're going to win this fucking league and it's because of us that's the thing is that like the underdog situation I actually enjoy it <laughs> We're the only team, I think. I think if it was Arsenal or... Like, you saw it a couple of weeks ago where City played Liverpool and Liverpool absolutely battered City for the majority of that game. And Arsenal fans are, are sat there going, yeah, but we're more worried about City because it's actually us and City. Yeah, we're, we're not worried about Liverpool, it's us and City. <clears throat> and it's... Use, it feels like you have to be acknowledged as the best. Yeah. Where with Liverpool, I love that you think I'm an underdog. Yeah. I love yeah. that you never thought I had a chance because what we're best at is being underdogs because we're the ones who feel like everyone's against us and we use that. So I love the idea of being an underdog. I love being third best because it just means that we have much more of a say. I just, it goes back to it, I just... Again, because I don't agree, I don't disagree with any of the things. And yet, at the same time, I'm just starting to like. It was like a wake up, waking up on Monday morning, looking at it, going, "This." Uh, uh, 
how are we not the best coach team if we're able to deliver on what we're able to deliver on without three or four of our absolute, not just nailed on starters, but best in class in the world, footballers in those given positions at, at, at times. And, you know, and how are we not, how are we not a better overall team than, than Manchester City when we're able to, you know, they've not closed the gap. You know, cities literally have not closed. Haven't no. you know? They, they, they haven't it's been done extended, it. if anything. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, and this Arsenal, the supposedly brilliant, brilliant team, who've, who've, and they have by their own terms, they've 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 come on leaps and bounds from this time a year ago, no doubt about it. And I'm happy for Liverpool to still continue to go under the radar. That's absolutely fine by me. But it was a little bit of like, and I'm still not convinced because I still don't. I still, I'm not going to sit here and say Liverpool are definitely going to win the league mm. now because I don't. I don't. I don't. In my heart of hearts, truly believe it because we shouldn't. But every week, when it's supposed to come completely undone and crashing down, we just seem to find a way to keep going. And it's frightening to me, the idea that we might, in the next couple of weeks, get Trent Alexander-Arnold back in this team. And if it's only just him, I mean, what else can we do when we've got that available? If we get Alisson back at some point before the end of the season, mm. if we've got Diogo Jota back in before at some point before the end of the season, again, Salah's back now. Just, just back. Yeah. And if we can get it, and he did, again, he was so rusty. And you can see by his performance levels. Like, yeah, what I, if? Adding players of that ilk, calibre and stature, add, adding them back to the squad, seeing that as a bonus is quite frankly ridiculous. Like, it is hard to fathom where we find ourselves now, given what we've had not at our disposal in recent weeks. The list of names you just produced there is just ridiculous. You could add a couple more to that if you really wanted to as well. If you really wanted to... Well, just for the argument's sake, Stefan Bacchetta was exactly. playing every week for us yeah. this time of year. And he was brilliant last year yeah. as well, so you really could stretch the parameters a little bit further. Yeah, but I'm with Chris. I think it's the, the intangibles that we possess that the other clubs, our rivals, aren't able to tap into sets us apart from them in my opinion um, but yeah in terms of like you say in terms of quality of team in terms of quality of coaching I, I don't have a real problem with what's been said there but again they don't have what we have they will never have what we have in a lot of ways either so I just think it's remarkable and I with Chloe as well I, the way we go about it and the way we do it is just the best way in my opinion and the fact that all the noise this week in the build up to the weekend was about the title the side and the title race but it was solely focused on Arsenal Man City and like a, a winner takes all situation Situation or is the loser out of it whilst we it almost it was there for all to see because we were the other game we were kind of like the other talking point and we just went about our business and nobody was putting any attention whatsoever on us and I think you're right as well we like that yeah. whereas it feels like if people aren't talking about Arsenal Manchester City they're sort of take a front to that and go well hang on what about us we're not bothered yeah, yeah. yeah. also by the way I'm so sorry but um, we're saving footy here because when they both went to my head to head that was the most boring game of football I've ever watched in my life to oh, be God. discussed on the best <laughs> football podcast after this, head to redmenplus.com and check that show out, which we'll be doing shortly after we finish this one. Uh, right, short break from us, then we're going to chat Liverpool's managerial options and Sheffield United as well in a bit. Hello everyone, we've got an amazing competition prize for you this month. It is this incredible Liverpool away shirt from 0405, signed by none other than goal scoring hero that season, Mr. Neil Mellor. Yes, if you want to be in the draw to win this, then head to redmenplus.com, sign up as a legend tier subscriber or upgrade from a captain tier and get your name in the hat at the end of the month for this wonderful signed Liverpool shirt. See you there. Yes, get your name in the hat for that wonderful signed Liverpool share. Draw being done at the end of the month. Go to redmenplus.com, sign up as a legend tier subscriber uh, and yeah, and get your name on the wheel of names in, uh, in you know four weeks' time. Um, right, yes. Just, yeah, it's so funny. We, we had a very, very brief conversation there about like, because last week on the Bias Footy Show, we were looking at the fixtures, the final 10, the running for us, Arsenal and City <laughs> and having a chat about the Champions League and all that. And then the more I think about it, the more... I, I'm not sure they will get past will get past Bayern, but I just now, now want both of those teams to play as many games as they can and just let them slug it out amongst themselves. But yeah, we'll do more on that. Um I'm biased. Anyway. Um right, Chris Sabie Alonso uh, has uh reaffirmed his commitment to Bayer Leverkusen he won't be leaving them in the summer takes him out himself therefore out of the running for the Liverpool Bayern um, certainly jobs this summer and potentially um, Real Madrid as well I 
my overall, I think months ago when this came out, I think the only I, other ideal circumstance other than him joining as Liverpool manager was I, I said I'd respect him if he stayed at Bayer because, look, he's doing an amazing job with them and it actually speaks, it's actually, uh, it speaks to his character as well, actually being able to stick it out when you've got some, a good thing going. Um, so in that regard, it, it it did take the edge a little bit off it for me, but how did you feel about the overall um, the overall situation? Gutted, gutted, because I, I do think he's the 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 class candidate. To mm. be honest with you, the, the absolute perfect fit for for Liverpool Football Club, and I, I don't see the others as being perfect. That doesn't mean they can't succeed. Doesn't mean I won't get behind them. It just means I'm disappointed that Xabi Alonso won't be Liverpool manager next season, yeah. and I, it means I'll be really pissed off next year when he signs for Real Madrid. And I know <laughs> the the international break where he took a little bit of time to, the, you know, think about what his future held meant he got tapped up by Real Madrid, uh, and it all got organised and, and stuff like that. So now I, I am I am absolutely gutted about it. Um, but we're Liverpool Football Club, we're Liverpool Football Club fans, so we'll just crack on regardless and without Zabby and prove that it can be done another way because it's what we've always done, isn't it? Yeah, I am. Um, Chloe, how are you doing? Um, I mean, he was the one that everyone had set their dreams on, isn't it? It was the, it was kind of we we put ourselves in the position where it was him or it was absolutely not, and because you just felt gutted by it. Um. I think it's a risk for him just in terms of not not in terms of what he's doing because I actually think you know <coughs> it actually might help him but um this was your chance to be Liverpool manager and I'm not sure it comes around again for yeah. another eight to ten years Possibly. to be perfectly honest if, if things go well hopefully yeah yeah, yeah. Doing something um, right. then you know and and even then in, in a couple of years time the, the thing is I don't think you could ever go to Bayern Munich then because I think you're gonna ruin everything that you've done at Bayer Leverkusen, no matter how many years you've stayed there. If you could there. just ruin Bayer Munich, that would be enough, though. Yes. That would soften the blow, wouldn't it? Um, but, you know, the, the Real Madrid and Bayern uh, jobs come around more often than Liverpool one, and I think that was the most important, is the fact that actually, who knows if he'll ever become Liverpool manager, mm. because it felt like that was the time. He's young, he's exciting, uh, he's what is the next best thing in everyone's minds. Um, but at the same time, he's chosen not to come to us, so that's fine. I'll crack on without you and I'll hopefully do better than, do, than you. It does make you think, sorry to interrupt there, Chloe, it does make you think that Liverpool were looking at the right guy, though, doesn't yeah. it? In the same, you know, to, to mm -hmm. sort of what you're saying is like, you know, it, would Jäger maybe have left after winning one Bundesliga yeah, title? I don't think he probably there's would. There's integrity there, isn't there? There's it? integrity, yeah. isn't there? And there's a belief in what he's doing. And, you know, he might look at it and go, well, I'm still the only side in Europe that's undefeated. Maybe yeah. to win a Champions League, the best place I could, could be <gasps> is Leverkusen. Mm. Because people are going to want to go and want to play for him. His star's shining pretty brightly at the moment. He's proved that he can take a team and turn them probably into league champions and, you know, go quite far in Europe. Maybe he wants that experience to fall back on before he has the intense limelight of a huge job. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, there's, there's so much to respect from his decision. There's so much to hate from his decision the, at the same the, time. The I'm thing torn. Is, is what, like, you look at it and if he wins, obviously they're the, the big team in the D. FB, F, Poker. Yes, that's They'll it. They'll win that, by the way. Um, if, if the Yeah, if, if they win the double and look, I hope they don't, but they could win the Europa League as well. Like, what else can he improve on? Next year, yeah, might actually be a disappointing year for you yeah, if you can't replicate why, it. Yeah, no, I get that, right? Yeah. But, like, what if you can build another side? No, yeah in Germany and become a European superpower for all the stuff that Guardiola's done in his career and he's achieved a hell of a lot in terms of trophies he doesn't have that you built a team up and conquered Europe no. mm -hmm. like is that what he wants because that might be it and he's at the perfect club for that I think more likely what he wants is Champions League experience yeah, more agree. Champions League experience under his belt I think Chris was mm -hmm. right in your initial thing of like it's the spotlight thing Liverpool, Real Madrid and Bayern Munich are just huge football clubs. They're the final bosses. That's where you you want to end up at what a club uh, and probably not even Bayern if we're being honest. You know what I mean? Because uh, cause it is it's, it's a bit There's six fleet. managers in four years well, or yeah, and it's, yeah. and it, you, you, it's a hard to fail at Bayern Munich isn't it to, to some extent as well. But the Hi Harry at <laughs> <laughs> well, he's doing all right, did he? Um, he's yeah, doing all right. Personally, personally yeah, that's yeah, all Harry cares yeah, about. It's the Cristiano Ronaldo effect. Um, 
But yeah, th- there is something to like you, you know you need to know how to conduct yourself when you're playing two games a week and they're, they're, they're of the highest level. And you, you're now going to be expected next season to challenge for the title again, whilst also making a good fist of of the Champions League as well. So there is a little bit to that. I, I would ra- I, if we were choosing our ideal Liverpool candidate, Dan, we'd want someone who's got that as well. Yeah. And that's that's kind of what the problem with all of this is that Alonso felt like the best of the lot. But I wouldn't have been looking around when I, I think about when we've gone for managers in the past. We've been a bit. Rafa Benitez changed the game for us, I think, mm-hmm. because you know we were linked with forever linked with Alan Kerbish, Lees of this world, and you know good good English lads or whatever yeah. you know around that. You know even like Ule coming in didn't come in with a, an amazing track record of being a, a club manager. I don't think he really even had a record to, to be honest. He had a, he was very wildly criticised for his hand in France not qualifying for the World Cup in 94 mm-hmm. as well. Um, but all of a sudden Benitez came in as there was two hot managerial prospects. Mourinho had won the Europe, European Cup, Benitez had won the UEFA Cup. Rafa had a, had, had a better domestic record because he'd won a better league with, with Valencia in Spain. Mourinho had obviously dominated with Porto in the Portuguese league. Mm-hmm. Um, Klopp was another one who challenged, you know, broken hegemony of, of Bayern Munich, made a good fist of Europe as well. If you hand picking it, Alonso still a little, is a little green for the Liverpool job. Um, but at the same notion, there's not like anyone else out there is really pulling up trees is the obvious candidate no that's it isn't it yeah and I think you have to be spot on that was the only real drawback everyone I spoke to in the round it people that knew him people that played for him with him that was the only thing you could ever really put in the cons list is the fact that he was a little bit lacking in experience obviously well so should I be and 18 months into what is a so far a wonderful job at Bayer Leverkusen but you're right in an ideal world you would have that extra 12 months that Champions League football box tick but Liverpool aren't living in the ideal world because in the ideal world Jürgen Klopp wouldn't be leaving and we'd be having this conversation conversation two years 18 months down the line and then Xavi Alonso would have that experience it'd be a completely different landscape but so for all of the that one con yeah he's done it as a player no that was my that was thing. the other thing yeah, isn't it my... he's done it as a also, World Cup winner Euros winner Champions that, League winner one different league he's played under a who's who of football managers as yes. well so he will have tapped into their experience along the way so even that con all of a sudden when you look at it and you really unpick you think okay well that's not even that bad a thing anyway because you're right he's been there he's done it he's seen it as a player so it's a completely different conversation but yeah I can't really begrudge him his decision to stay I think had we been sat here and going oh he's chosen Bayern Munich or he's chosen Real Madrid I'd be furious and disappointed as it is because again I think he was the man for the job I think the stars felt like they'd aligned and albeit the timing's far from perfect he is definitely the one I would have wanted so yeah definitely definitely a little bit gutted by it all do I think that's the end of us no far from it do I think we'll be fine yeah I do and and also I will say this as much as I love Xabi Alonso and I think his managerial credentials his trajectory is very much pointing in the right direction and again I think it's probably a smart decision from him to stick around because it might have been a bit of a jump too soon for him to make that leap so credit to him for that I think I want the manager at Liverpool Football Club who's going to walk through hell and high water to be the manager at Liverpool Football Club. Yes. And Javi Londo clearly yeah. isn't that right now. Mm-hmm. So, Shall again, when I kind of remove the emotion and detach myself from the romanticism of it being Javi Londo, I think, OK, fine. And I also do wonder whether Michael Edwards is that that thing whereby they say you take emotion out of decisions, he's going to take emotion out of this decision, so we will get the best man for the job, and maybe that wasn't Javi Londo. But <sighs> yeah. for all intents and purposes, when you look at the, the connection and the data... He might well have been that. Yeah, there's also a case of he doesn't come across as that type of man, but he actually might also be intimidated by the fact that Jurgen Klopp. Like we keep Big talking about, well, yeah. you know, it it would be a dream because it's it's the Liverpool manager. It's being you know the manager of one of the greatest football clubs in world football. Well, we see um, it as the pinnacle. That's what we see it thing, as, yeah. It? yeah but yeah. It, but it also, I guess, it can be intimidating. You've got a really good crop of players there, and you've got to come in and somehow hit the ground running. Um, and maybe maybe he did see it a little bit as that's actually a little bit too intimidating for this early on. And he might have looked at Gerard and no way am I comparing those two careers, by the way, in in terms of um, managerial careers. But Stephen Gerrard jumped at the the quickest opportunity because he thought I might never get another Premier League team and he jumped and now he's over managing Etifak who sit middle of the table um, in, in a crap league like that's just what happened so maybe maybe he was slightly intimidated it by the It does feel like he's got a plan it. for his managerial yeah. career and it's one that Which, you're probably right because know. maybe this wasn't part of the plan and yeah. he's sticking to it I mean, yeah. before, look, I mean Jürgen was asked about it pre-match wasn't he you know there's no way Jürgen Klopp wasn't getting offers from like year one at Dortmund 
onwards. Do you know what I mean? The year two Dortmund onwards, he'd have been having all kinds of people knocking on the door going, do you fancy it, do you fancy it? But we he, know he, Bayern he, wanted him yeah, for the longest time. You know, so. he's, he's, he's having a good time at Bayer Leverkusen. He's settled in. You know, I was reading stuff saying he, you know, he didn't he didn't particularly want the Sociedad job originally. He then stuck it out longer at Sociedad when he was offered a job a, a season earlier in that one as well because he wanted to continue to make sure he got this stuff under his belt. And ultimately, it might put down to it because, it's, again, it's hard for us to imagine this because it's very anti-modern football. But he... He might just really enjoy his life. He might just be like, you know, he might just be settled. His family might be happy. He really like who he's working with and all that kind of stuff. And he's about to win the league. And he might think, well, why, why can't I go? Because we're all going. Well, what if it goes wrong? Elite people don't think that mm. way. It might, and it might be that moment. You know, we might be looking at. Like, it might be a Gerard moment where he's missed his window of opportunity, and then it all the wheels all come off next year. Bayern Munich just throw a load of money at the problem, and all of a sudden they steamroll you into into the ground like they always do. And that looked like a stupid move, but you've, I, I, what I said to this is like, you've got to own the big moves in your life. And as galling as it is, because I think we'd all choose Liverpool, because of course we would. I don't think this thing make. I don't think this is into how much he does or doesn't love Liverpool. He's obviously got a connection with Liverpool, but he clearly has a connection with Bayern and and and, and Real Madrid as well mm. to be expected. So yeah, I, again, I respect it. I don't like it, but I but I, I can I can empathise. I can I can respect that. Where it leaves us is my major concern over this is that I look at who's left. And where it was, go- I said this weeks ago on this is that Alonso just had carried with him an aura that I think would have allowed us to all take a big deep breath in what we're doing and what we're coming. And I look at what's left, and it goes back to this thing of when Klopp, when you go for Jurgen Klopp, he's a guy who's exceeded expectations in the Bundesliga with a team that's not expected to win the league and not meant to, you know, it's meant to challenge me there or thereabouts, but it's telling Dortmund haven't come close, you know, been, been that good since mm. Klopp left. Um, Again, Rafa Benitez just breaks down Real Madrid and Barcelona with the, with the third best team, the, a team that he makes the third best team, and then the best the best team in La Liga. I mean, Depo were there all, all, all the yeah. time. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. exactly. Um, and and then I look at what's on the table now, and Ruben Amram now is the standout candidate in terms of at least what he's done. But we're talking about a guy who's won one. Premier League title, you know, we're not even talking a top five league in in, in Europe by all by all accounts. He's had some, a, a bit of domestic success. He, he played a lot of games at domestic level in the Portuguese league as well. So he's he's got something going for him. You, Chris, he's done a lot more on style of play and all that kind of stuff, and he, he feels like he would be a good fit. But it's another that you he's just got no experience outside of. Portugal to speak of and his, his success at Portugal hasn't been he's not the next Mourinho he's not going to win a Champions League while he's been there or whatever and then you're looking at the Zerbi and there's a guy who's had you know a reasonably successful one reasonably successful, successful season with Shakhtar he's done good things taking lesser lights in Italy and made them a bit competitive in a good style of football but nothing you'd say immediately translates to, to Liverpool Thomas Frank's done nothing um, and then you, and I'm starting to look around and go Ooh. everyone now feels there's a degree of gamble with every manager mm. and that would be even if you were getting Carlo Ancelotti in as Liverpool manager to follow Jürgen Klopp by the way but that's where I'm at now I don't, I'm I'm wary of stepping into this arena of speculation because I don't think anyone's the right fit and I'm running the risk of going, I don't think he's good enough or good enough or good enough and we're probably going to end up with one of these guys who is in inverted commas, not good enough. So this is the wilderness we're at right now. If you had to pick... Amarim. Mainly because, and I said this last week on a deep on a deep dive with Josh, I actually thought if you were taking the, the 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 tactics that the team plays currently and moving it to Liverpool, then his tactics fit best with Liverpool's more so than Alonso. But I mean, when we were talking on the way to the match yesterday, I was sort of saying like, well, there's no guarantee that Alonso uses the tactics he's used at Leverkusen at Liverpool because you make your tactics based on the players that you've got in your squad. Mm-hmm. So, but so basing it purely on Alonso's buy-in sides and Amarim's sporting side, I think he's, his tactics fit better. I think he's a better manager probably than the others that we're talking about. Nailsman's obviously, uh, I think, a, a very, very good candidate that the timing of doesn't work for me because yeah. of the Euros and all that being in Germany and pre-season starting and all that type of stuff. But I like Amarim and I, and I think the, the, mm-hmm. the one thing that you, you have to look at and 
you know, again, stuff that I've sort of spoken to people about and, and, and read about is that, you know, looking for a manager, according to Ian Graham, is the holy grail of analytics. Mm. It's very difficult to find how much an impact the manager has on a team. Um, but with all the names that we're mentioning, you can look at the manager as having a big impact on the team. Mm. And then, then you get to start down these sort of rabbit holes of, well, is the European experience and all this type of stuff. Well, sometimes you've got to learn on the job, unfortunately. And I think with the candidates that we've got, would you rather have a, a European experienced manager who's just not very good or a really good manager who doesn't have the European experience? I know where I'd sit. I'd rather the good manager who's, who's, you know, unfortunately I don't want them learning on the job, but if they're the best candidates because they're the best managers, you kind of got to go, okay, fine. There's just something to a manager, I think, Dan, who can, you know, because we've had this all the time. This is what David Moyes suffered with when he when he took the Manchester United job, as he was turning around to a bunch of guys who won absolutely everything and going, right, listen, lads, I know what you're doing here, but what I'm saying is when I had... You know Phil Jagielka and uh, you know and Leighton Baines and, and you know and and and, and, and mm-hmm. Nigel Martin in goal. You know and we were really scrapping for to- a top half finish with Everton. This is what we did, and it's like Ryan Giggs or whatever type people are going like four four two. That's what we did at Manchester United. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, great. Having someone who can at least call upon when I did this, you know yeah. what I mean? Yeah, I've yeah. got a tangible, when I won this, this mm. is how I went about achieving yeah. it. Achieving it is my, is, is a, a little bit of a barrier to entry for me. Yeah, I, I know it is, absolutely it is, yeah. And I suppose that's where the personality has to shine through more than ever. And that ability to be a leader and ability to be a manager has to transcend what's gone before, I guess. And uh, f- f- in all accounts, you know, Amarin has that. And what he has done as well, which I'll kind of come back to, is like, he has upset the natural order a little bit in Portugal. They, Sporting, albeit one of the clubs in Portugal, of course, they weren't necessarily serial winners of that league. I think far from anyone. Like, like the first, years first time in 19 years. So he's got that under yeah. his belt. You know what I mean? So yeah. I, I'm okay with it. Do I think it's ideal? No, but I don't think Liverpool live in an ideal world once again. We're not exactly awash with candidates that go, it has to be him, has to be him. It feels like Amarim is definitely the next best. It's for like that throughout this entire process. It was some drop, by the way, from Alonso to Amarim, but I believe it's some drop again to the rest of the yeah. candidates. I think mean, they're all in a, a pool swilling around somewhere below him. So, yeah, I think you're right. I think in an ideal world, they would have to look what I've won. Playing career, managerial career, whatever it may be, look what I did. And the players instantly have that respect. You know who he is coming through the door, etc., etc. I think that'd be perfect. Does he possess that? No. But does he have the, the personality, the character, the charisma, the leadership, the managerial qualities to make that not matter? Quite possibly. I mean, look at Jurgen Klopp. Like his playing career was hardly no. outstanding. Obviously, don't get wrong, what he did as a manager before he got to Liverpool stood him in good enough yeah. stead in that elite category for players to instantly respect him. But at some point at Dortmund, and indeed Mainz to a certain extent, he would have had to convince players that what he was saying they had to get behind yeah. because he didn't have the playing career to stack it up. So it's not necessarily... The be all and end all is kind of what I'm trying to it's say. It's easier to do that though at clubs that have lower expectations. One hundred percent. Yeah, one hundred percent. I just want, just lastly, Chloe. Just for, it does for me. This now poses the question of: Are we not? Is it worth revisiting Pep Linders as a conversation? Now, what's he won? But he's been there while. But he has at he least been. Hammer and work for Mourinho. Fucking mm. one loads. Pep Linders to me feels like a stopgap waiting for Alonso. Yeah, and that, but that's, that's all it is. and that, but that's a, but that's a conversation I think is is a worthwhile conversation at this point because if you number one choice, Liverpool don't buy centre halves on a number one choice. Centre halves mm-hmm. not available, and God knows how many other times you've got Pep there who gives you that, you know, yeah, and also really he's not going to cost you loads of money you know, because he's you know, he's probably still got a contract if we really wanted to to hold him to it or whatever. He's there's a continuity aspect there that he knows what the insides and outs of the football club. It does make me think, you know, because again, and do you think, for in your opinion, is he in that same sort of pool that Deserby and Thomas Frank, for example, inhabit? No, he's higher than them because what I'm looking at right now is someone who I can buy into as a manager. That is the most important thing for me right now. Um, and I'm so sorry to say it, but Deserby, there is just something about that man that I just can't. Like if he was on the touchline for Liverpool, and bear in mind if he does, I'm going to have to get behind yeah, him and yeah. fully support him, and I will. Mm. But there's just something about him that I just can't get on board with, and I cannot pinpoint it at all. Like I physically have thought about this for months, and I cannot 
understand what it is. I just don't like it. There's just something that I'm not getting on with there. Like it's I don't the know. Hair gel. It, it might be the hair gel. Um with Amarine, there's 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 a, a character there that I can buy into. There's um passion, passion exactly there. that. Um there's the fact that, you know, <sighs> He's done it with a club who were sleeping giants in the likes of Sporting and Liverpool were once there and Jürgen Klopp kind of did that. Um, and there is just something more that I can grasp onto and I can turn around and say, yeah, absolutely, I can get behind that lad. I can buy into what he wants me to do um, as a fan. And I could do that instantly with Jürgen Klopp. What I will say with the, the Pep Linders thing is, uh, once again, Thomas Frank, there's something about it. I do not like it and I do not want it. Pep Linders is above them two for me just because... He is someone who I've been able to buy into alongside Jürgen Klopp. Um, it wouldn't be my answer because I, there's just, like you said, there a stopgap. And to be perfectly honest, he doesn't deserve that. He's got potentially Ajax lining him up here. He deserves to have a go at being a, a manager and having a go at trying to bring them success. And I'm not sure he could do that at Liverpool. He needs, I think it was you mentioned earlier, he's got no backroom staff. His backroom staff are Jürgen's staff who yeah. are all just getting off. Um, and we don't know how he'll, how he'll work on his own. We know how he worked with Jürgen Klopp. He's a much more senior man who's done it before. He, we know what it was like when he had someone who was more superior above him. Um, we don't know what he's like on his own. So yeah, it's it's a tough one to t- to understand. Um, Plus, he's changed, hasn't it, significantly? Before I do the obvious of saying, like you know, the guy, you know, Bob Paisley had no managerial experience, yeah. mm. and Joe Fagan had no managerial experience, and Kenny Dalglish had no managerial experience. And we're able to come in and continue the ball rolling. And there is a little bit, and that's what I mean. This is an interesting conversation that's going to follow. It feels like he's just been completely, he's completely bombed out of the running. And there must be some reasoning behind that. We've heard him say he always said he'd leave when Jürgen left. Yeah. Does he himself feel like he's not ready to take the top job? Is he? T- we don't know. We don't know the truth behind any of this because it felt for years. My immediate thought when that Jürgen Klopp video dropped, I was walking back to ours trying to fathom it all out with tears in my eyes and my immediate reaction was cool we'll just give it to, we'll just give it to pep and that'll be and i can i could i could immediately make my peace with that um but the, for that to be instantly taken away it's yeah it's it's, it's just yeah it's mad isn't it because I, I, again I, I, I agree with chloe on this it's like what makes me feel more comforted and my level of comfort is has got nothing to do really ultimately with this, because there's smarter people with more data points and all these kind of things going on who know more behind the scenes and the stories. It might be that no one likes him behind the scenes and they might not want him. He might, they might be itching to just have a clean break because you hear loads of stuff about him and Jürgen and, and all that kind of stuff, don't you, about how they are, they can be quite spiky characters or whatever within it. I don't know. It's, it's, it's pure yeah. speculation at this point. So it's so unique the Liverpool job, isn't it? We essentially touched on this earlier on when we talked about how well coached Man City and Arsenal are. We need to be well coached, of course. We're doing tactics and systems and all that sort of stuff. Absolutely imperative. That's why systematically, I think our memes are fit as well. But we require so much more than that. You've got to buy in. You've got to understand what it means to manage a football club. There has to be that motivational side of things. That's not to say other managers don't possess that, of course, and other clubs don't need that as well. But I think we are so unique in what we want and what we demand. I mean, we want somebody who can come in and motivate the players and also the fans can get behind. It just feels very different to me. We don't want this sort of run of the mill, these brilliant tactics, and that's fine. And I'm with you on the Deserby stuff. I've made you know no secret of that whatsoever. Certainly upstairs, there's something intangible with Deserby that I can't get behind. There's something there's something missing there. And I don't think we'd ever gain that connection. And listen, I'm with you. If he does become the manager, I'll have to buy into him. I have to get behind him and I back him to the hilt. Of course I will. But there's something about the way he goes about his business. It doesn't sit right with me. And I think on top of that, his comments over the weekend about wanting to get out of Brighton doesn't feel right either. Klopp's been the opposite of that. His communication skills have been wonderful. He's always said the right things at the right time. I don't think Deserby has so. Managing Liverpool Football Club to sort of round off the point is more than just being a football manager. We've seen that in Jurgen Klopp's entire reign, and nobody can come in and emulate that. It's nigh on impossible. But somebody has to get close to that for me and at least have similar sort of beliefs and similar sort of ways of going about the business. And not many in this conversation tick those boxes. Unfortunately, that's why Alonso was so perfect. I just think Amarim's the next best by some distance. Yeah. Mm. And and like you said there, Jurgen, what he's done is he's came in and he's felt like actually he's from the city of Liverpool he yeah, could exactly, have been yeah. a scouser yeah, in it. Like it, for every moral everything that he's came out on and he has been proactive on things he's gone out of the way to um, make sure that community is um, uh, has spoken out for it. he's just his proper sound he L- seems just boss. just on this though by the way just Rafa Benitez ended up being a wonderful fit as Liverpool manager yeah, yeah, of course. but didn't 
I mean, is a guy who's very rarely leaves a football club in any sort of positive way. I mean, fucking Valencia airbrushed him out of like title winning photos and stuff when he left that club. He had mad issues with them. He's had loads of stuff along the way. He's not a particularly like, loving sort of guy. Not a huge, you know, gregarious character like Klopp and whatever. But we took him to our hearts. I'm sure we can, you know, people need the opportunity to be exposed to Liverpool. In order We're to, in a to Winning masks yeah, at all. That like that, that's, the, that's the big thing. I Listen, I had real problems with Brendan Rodgers being the Liverpool manager before he was given the Liverpool manager's job. Mm. And in 13, 14, he was the greatest manager yeah. we've had yeah. for 20 odd years. Or but whenever. we weren't like, just coming out of the clock ever, were we? No, of course. It, and that's yeah. different. And that's why it's interesting for me the Pep Linders stuff is because he's clearly a brilliant football coach. But if you're, you're going to sit here and tell me that you're worried about Amarin because he's only won the fifth best league in Europe, which it is officially one of the top five Head now above France, France. Think, yeah, yeah a couple of years ago they changed yeah. that um, and he's won a league title after 19 years for a side that hadn't done it then I've got concerns over Pep Linders for his one failed attempt at management yeah. you know and, and it's not, don't get me wrong I think Pep Linders could be a great manager I really do. I, I don't know how he'd react but I'd have to see that in front of the press week in week out but what you've got to go on past successes or failures and stuff when you're looking for a Liverpool manager, and I think Liverpool's setup would be better for him than it is under Jurgen Klopp, yeah. because they take they are essentially looking for a head coach now. They're not looking for a football manager. Yeah. But equally, Pep Linders is the coach of the team. Mm. He doesn't yeah. make the big decisions. He coaches what Jurgen asks mm -hmm. him to coach, and he has a big part mm -hmm. of how we play and stuff like that. But what happens when you're the man who's making the decisions that's when it can go wrong so i think you need to look for managers nowadays or teams sorry head coaches who've run it and their decisions are the be all and end all when you're looking for a job of the magnitude of liverpool football club can i also just say that like Jürgen klopp's been the manager of liverpool for pretty much a third of my life so like we're user all sat here talking about Rafa Benitez and all that. I was three or four it's when he won a Champions League. Yeah, so yeah, is, yeah. literally, yeah. so like this Unless is actually you know twenty seven all of a sudden. Yeah, no, <laughs> not even a third. But the like it's break, yeah. um, but but that's what I mean. Like I don't, I've not really known yeah. any different. So. When I think about the, <laughs> when I, when it I, wasn't very good for no, the no, no. years long. You have a bit but. <laughs> but when I think of like the the things I can grasp onto for the you know this is the longest manager in my career in my career in my life, um, like I'm gonna try and grasp onto the fact of how I felt with a manager who really. I could buy into and that is what I'm going to hold on to. It's just that thing of Pep Guardiola doesn't look like he's going anywhere anytime soon unless City get absolutely, absolutely shagged <laughs> everywhere by PSR, but we'll see. Um, Arteta looks like he's in it for you know for a good old run at the moment, and I just wonder whether this, you know we're now in that world now because that was my assurance this whole time. Every time a good football club got a new manager, I was like, "There's Jurgen Klopp and there's Pep Guardiola, yeah, right, and everyone right. else is underneath." And now mm -hmm. we're shopping in that pool like like mere mortals, you know. And we're gonna have to do this when we have to go and buy Salah's replacement. We're gonna have to go and find yeah. the world where the guy who plays on that right hand side might score loads of goals or might get loads of assists, but he's not gonna do both because it's impossible to buy someone. Based Basically, because it's such a small margin, we're going to have to play Van, replace Van Dijk at some point, Trent at some point, and and Allison at some point, and we're going to have to deal with, with with just having really, really good instead of like best in the history of all time kind of levels, and that's just bad. And that, that goes back to this thing about Jurgen Klopp taking this decision now. All the respect in the world to him for knowing himself and all that, but. It's I can't, I'm not going to sit here and tell you that it's. It, there's no way that it can be as good. Be, and it, it, anything can be good, by the way, and it's got a possibility. But when you're dealing in probabilities, mm. like we're going to have to enter into a mad world where there is no one who does, you know, because this feelings thing's too big. Mm. Like I want when that guy stood goes toe to toe and shakes hands with. Pep Guardiola, Klopp's won because I know he could beat him in a fight. It sounds stupid, doesn't yeah. it? But like, oh, so Jürgen Klopp could kick Pep Guardiola's head and that matters to me weirdly, you know what I mean? Whereas I look at the Zerbi walking into them and going, no. I think Arteta might be, I know he's a if little this scrappy. This is why CEOs guy. are all over six foot in some of the biggest companies in the world, you know. It, there's, a mad, there's a mad thing yeah. on it, isn't there? Like, he, like, there's just no respect there for a five foot nine, lads, yeah. unfortunately. But um, yeah, it's mad, isn't it? Because there's, there's, a, there's, a, there's a lot of moving parts and things like that. I don't want to consider a world where we've got to revisit this in a year 
or in two years' time because that means that we've had to go through two years of Liverpool being so crap that we need to consider the manager manager's position again, which is a bit mad because there's a world where Pep goes away and does Ajax. Jordan Henderson maybe comes under his wing as like an assistant manager. No, Jordan Henderson's not, you know, flavour of the month on our may side, but whatever. You know, you could see you could see them being at something like down the line. I always thought Milner would come back as some sort of like assistant down the line to Pep. That would be a possibility. It's, it's then, too, too many unknowns yeah, at this point. Yeah, you know, I don't just go to roll it back to the Pep line. There's stuff like Arteta is essentially the Pep line. There's Arsenal mm-hmm. at the yeah. moment. Is he yeah. hadn't had a number one job? Yeah, takes a bit of time, but he's absolutely has absolutely proved that he's a world class manager. And you know, equally Guardiola had no management experience before he basically started winning every trophy every single year. Yeah. You know, the the, the football. <laughs> Is, uh, 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 football is littered with managers who come into big football clubs and start winning or coaches who become managers and start winning and Xabi Alonso is another one of those isn't mm. he really to be fair to him who's mm. now the best we're a year and a half away from everyone thinking Gerard was going to be the next manager of Liverpool Football Club and Xabi Alonso is the guy that we're gutted about now who hadn't even started his managerial journey then yeah. so for all the you know the the, the, the feelings of, of guilt and I don't know disappointment that you're feeling something can just pop up out of nowhere yeah. and be the right thing yeah, that's it and it, it's just go back to the thing I'm, I'm long enough in the tooth to know that when you've got somewhat having a, a world class goalie a world class centre half a world class goal scorer and a world class manager you can try and you can throw all the money in the world at those positions but you just get them wrong for a variety of circumstances and variety of, Manchester United have been trying to replace Alex Ferguson for a decade and they haven't deliberately got it wrong they've just got it wrong you know like Chelsea have tried a million times in a variety of different ways and got, got gotten things sometimes they get it right sometimes they get it wrong Arsenal got it wrong a bit in the Wenger I think they got it wrong by keeping Wenger around for so long mm. then got it the wrong fits along, along the way and for the best will in the world you can bring guys in it just doesn't work there was no ill intent behind bringing Roy Hodgson in as Liverpool manager somebody looked at his uh, at what he had going and went he could, should be able to do a decent job as Liverpool boss yeah, Kenny Dalglish well, came Palace in and finished top half one season well yeah you know he got to the Europa League final and everyone went okay that's a promising thing looking at what we've got now Andre Andoni Araola is like the new Roy Hodgson in terms of that isn't he because that's what he's got on his on his sort of CV it's wild and that's the problem about Jürgen Klopp is he's too big and too good at too many things mm. um I thought this was supposed to be a happy podcast and we were top of the table because now I'm it just depressed before. yeah yeah Sorry, we run out of time. We'll do happy f- stuff as well. Um, it was a bit like yesterday's game. We were brilliant first half and second half. We let them back into it. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, it's interesting. It's an interesting stuff, and this is where we're at. We're gonna. This, this is this is the conversation point moving forward, isn't it? It's, it's hanging over our head. The good thing is, is we've got Jurgen Klopp for another nine league games, bare minimum, a maximum of fourteen more football matches. So yeah, let's soak that up while we can, because yeah, it's going to be a wild ride. <laughs> and also, as Chloe said, we're top of the table. Yeah, yeah. Um, Sheffield United up next uh, we haven't got time to go into that one so do check out the match preview uh, which will be out on Wednesday Steve's going to be hosting that and we'll probably have a little chat about it on Bias Footy Pod just to make up for it so come and join us over on Redmen Plus for that one where yes the Liverpool are top of the table positivity chat will continue because we get to slap we're going to laugh at Man United we're going to laugh at Everton and we're going to laugh at all the Arsenal fans uh, absolutely like pigs and shit over the moon because they basically lost top spots in the Premier League by playing down football um, check us out thank you so much for watching for listening and we're we'll back with another uh, Redman Originals podcast next week. Ta-da. Hey, thank you so much for checking out the content today. If you want to get your name in and amongst these wonderful people, uh, then head to redmenplus.com. Join as a legend tier subscriber. You're going to get free merchandise, merchandise codes. You're going to get in our Discord and you're going to get your name at the end of YouTube videos. Yes, redmenplus.com, legend tier status.